I were to ask you, what is the ultimate final goal of human history, what would you say? The Bible tells us that history is headed toward its final chapter. The Bible calls a new heaven and a new earth. A friend once remarked to Mark Twain, I'm worried the world is coming to an end. Don't worry about it. Twain replied, we could get along without it. Well, the world is coming to an end in one sense of the word, but it's the beginning of a new world. We can get along without this current world of sin and suffering. God is going to give us a new world in his time. The end of this age will be the beginning of a new age with a new heaven and a new earth. Let's put Bible prophecy in perspective today. What have we learned in this study together, understanding Bible prophecy and the return of Christ? Well, the next great event in human history is the return of Christ and what's called the rapture of the church. That's going to set forth the great tribulation, a seven-year period where the Antichrist rises. The tribulation is going to end with Christ's second coming at the Battle of Armageddon. Then he establishes his kingdom on earth called the millennium. After the millennium, there's a final judgment, removal of evil. And here's the last chapter. God will create a new heaven and a new earth. He'll restore this world to its original perfect condition as seen in the Garden of Eden. The Bible ends like it begins with the act of creation. In the book of Genesis, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now listen to how Revelation ends. God will restore all things. John writes, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Revelation 21, verse 1. Isaiah the prophet foresaw the same new creation. Listen to how he talked about the creation coming. Behold, God says, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and his people a joy. Isaiah 65, verse 7 through 18. There's Isaiah living hundreds of years before Jesus. He saw a glimpse of a new heaven and a new earth. The apostle Peter writes the same prophecy. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness, 2 Peter 3, verse 14. Now let's look at this phrase, a new heaven. What does the Bible mean when it talks about heaven? Well, that word appears a lot in the Bible, doesn't it? Well, the Jews in the Old Testament and the teachings of Jesus talk about heaven in three ways. So there are three different heavens. First of all, there's the natural heaven. The heavens can mean just the environment around the earth, the atmosphere, the stratosphere that surrounds the earth, the canopy. That is the first heaven, the natural heaven. The psalmist said the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hand, Psalm 19 and 1. So the first heaven is just the canopy around the earth, the natural atmosphere. Second of all, there's a spiritual heaven. The Bible uses the term the heavenly realms or in the heavenlies to refer to the spiritual reality in the world. Not a place, but a reality. Just as there's a natural world, there are spiritual realities. A spiritual world that even includes angels and demons, spiritual forces. In the book of Ephesians, Paul the Apostle uses the phrase the heavenly realms five times in the heavens, in the heavenly realms. In other words, in the spiritual realm. And we all know that we are living in a natural world, but we're also spiritual beings, and we live in a spiritual world. So that's not a place, but it's a reality. Paul the Apostle in Ephesians says that we are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. That's Ephesians 2 and 6. He also says that we struggle not against flesh and blood, but against evil forces in the heavenly realms. That's Ephesians 6 and 12. So there is the first heaven, the natural heavens around us, the environment around the earth, the heavens, the galaxies, the stars, the heavens, space. There is the spiritual heaven, which means in the heavenly realms or in the spiritual realm. And then there is the third heaven, the divine heaven, the dwelling place of God. We think of where God dwells. Paul the Apostle says he was caught up to the third heaven and he saw inexpressible and glorious things in heaven, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 through 4. That passage always frustrates me. He says he went to heaven, he saw things so amazing, they were inexpressible and glorious. 
Because I read that, I'm thinking, tell us what you saw. We all want to know what's in heaven. But he said, it's so incredible. Paul the Apostle couldn't find one word to describe heaven when he was caught up to the third heaven in a vision to the very dwelling of God. Saw the angels of God. But he said it was so amazing, he couldn't find one word to tell us what it was like. That's astounding because Paul wrote Romans and Corinthians. He wrote about half of the New Testament nearly. And yet when he saw heaven, it was so incredible. He couldn't find one word to tell us what it was like. He said, it's so incredible. I can't find a word to tell you how great it is. There are over 100 references to heaven in the four gospels. Jesus spoke often about the kingdom of heaven. He taught us to pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So when the Bible uses the term heaven, it sometimes refers to the natural heavens of the environment, the space around us, the canopy around the earth, the stratosphere. It refers to the spiritual reality that we're spiritual beings or angelic beings or even demonic forces of evil. And he speaks of the third heaven, the highest heaven, the dwelling place of God. Jesus described it in John chapter 14, verse one through three. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Where is Jesus? He's in heaven. He's in heaven. And he says, when you die in this world, your soul is going to be received into heaven. So there's a new heaven and a new earth. Let's talk about the new earth because that's where we live. That's the planet where we live. And that's what we're all concerned with. What will life be like for us? What will this world be like? Ultimately, people are so worried about the world. Is it going to be obliterated in war? Is it going to perish because of climate change? We have what's called Earth Day. Well, the real Earth Day is will take place when God restores the earth to its perfection. When there's a new heaven and a new earth, that'll be the real earth day. The apostle Peter writes about this in a prophetic tone when he says that day, when Christ returns is what he means, that day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt with the heat, 2 Peter 3, verse 12. This planet, this terrestrial ball in which we live is about 25,000 miles in circumference and 8,000 miles in diameter. At the core of the earth is filled with boiling, molten elements. Maybe the unleashing of these elements will cause the earth to become a ball of fire in space as God purifies the world. Others see this passage as a reference to nuclear war. No one really knows. Personally, I think it probably just refers more spiritually to purification. But no one knows exactly, but it says the elements will disappear with a war. They'll melt with a fervent heat. But it's not a fire that destroys. It's a fire that develops. It's not a fire that terminates. It's a fire that transforms. He's making a new earth. A new earth is our promised inheritance. And regardless of the means by which God purifies this world, he has promised us a new heaven and a new earth. The world or the earth will never end. When people tell you, well, the, the end of the world's coming. Not in that sense. The earth is not going to be terminated. The planet is not going to be destroyed. The end in the Bible refers to the goal of history. The end is a prelude to a new beginning. So the world is not going to be destroyed. Make sure you tell your kids that are so worried sometimes about climate change and global changes. And people say the end of the world is coming. Some preachers say the end of the world is coming. It's not an end in the sense of destruction. It's an end of sin. It's an end of suffering. But it's the beginning of God's glorious future. God is in control of this world. It's not going to end. It's not going to perish. It's not going to be destroyed. Dismiss those fears and help your children not live in fear, but to live in hope that God will make a new heaven and a new earth. God is going to change this world into a better world. You say, when will all this happen? When will Jesus return? Well, when it comes to Bible prophecy, there's not a timeline. In fact, we've got to learn to trust God's time, not only prophetically, but also personally. Jesus tells us not to be concerned about the time. In fact, he told the disciples before we went to heaven, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, Acts chapter 1, verse 7 through 8. The word set here means predetermined or predestined. The second coming of Jesus is predestined. The new heaven and the new earth is predestined. We don't need to know the time or date because God has already predetermined these things. What we need to do is receive power from the Holy Spirit and live our lives victoriously for Him. 
What we need is real power from the Spirit, not predictions about the future to handle the pressure of our times. Jesus said, as lightning comes from the west and shines to the east, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. He will also come like a thief in the night. The hope of the world is the return of Jesus Christ. The last words of Jesus quoted in the Bible are these, yes, I am coming soon. Revelation 22 and 20. Let Jesus speak that to your heart. Yes, I am coming soon. The word yes means that he is faithful to keep his promise. That Jesus has delayed his return for some 2,000 years, but his promise to return is certain. When Jesus finished giving the prophetic signs of his coming that we've learned earlier in this study together, he said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Matthew 24, 35. And there specifically, he didn't just mean all the word of God, and that's true. He meant his word about his second coming. Horatius Bonar, a Scottish minister and musician, wrote these words about our Lord's return. Sometime, some ordinary day will come, a busy day like this, filled to the brim, with ordinary tasks, perhaps so full, they will have little thought or care for him. And there will be no hint from the silent skies. No sign, no clash of cymbals, roll of drums, and yet that ordinary day will be the very day in which our Lord will come. Now let's get to the bottom line. I'm a bottom line person. Maybe you are as well. We've talked so much about Bible prophecy and the Bible reveals so much to us and yet it leaves so much shrouded in mystery. So many details we don't know. I don't think we need to know. We need to know the big picture, the big story, that the world we live in is troubled. It's under the curse of sin and suffering. We're redeemed today. We're citizens of the kingdom today, but we know that one day Jesus will return. And when he does, he's going to restore the world to a state of perfection. And we're going to live and rule and reign with him forever. That's the bottom line. Three important truths are very important for us when it comes to Bible prophecy and applying it to our lives that I want to share with you as we conclude this study together. What do you need to take away from the subject of Bible prophecy in Christ's return? First of all, the world is safe in God's hands. The Bible prophecies are given to remind us that God is in control, that he is guiding the world to fulfill his promise. Human chaos is held in check by divine control. So I reiterate my point to you. The world is safe in God's hands. That's the first truth we learn of Bible prophecy. The second truth we learn is that the will of God will be accomplished. God works out everything in conformity to the purpose of his will, Ephesians 1 verse 11. God's purpose will prevail. He is working out everything, not causing everything, but in spite of all that goes on in the world, God is at work. And he's going to fulfill the purpose of his will. The third truth about Bible prophecy that we need to treasure is that the word of God can be trusted. All the prophetic signs Jesus gave are going to be fulfilled in our times. They assure us that the word of God can be trusted. Every prophecy we see fulfilled just reminds us that everything he says, not only in prophetic promises, but throughout the entire scripture, God's word can be trusted. His predictions come true. And if his predictions come true, then his promises are true. If his predictions are true, then his principles are true. There are over 300 Old Testament prophecies that were already fulfilled when Jesus came the first time. There are over 300 prophecies in the New Testament about his second coming. You see world events and you'll see prophetic signs coming to pass just reminds you that every word of God is true. Just you can trust God's prophetic word, you can trust his personal word to you. If you listen to the voice of the world, you will panic. If you listen to the word of God, you will be at peace. So focus your heart and mind today on the promises of God. Join me for prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the promise of our Lord's return. We trust you in the future. We don't understand everything about it. And yet we see enough to know that Christ is coming. We have eternal life. You're going to make a new heaven and a new earth. And you have an incredible eternal future planned for your children. And I pray today that every person will come to a greater knowledge 
of the understanding that you are in control and that they'll be able to apply that same principle to their own life. You're in control of their life. You're working on everything in their life for the purpose of your will and that your personal word to them can be trusted as much as your prophetic word. We receive your word today with grateful hearts. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Thank you for sharing this Bible study with me. Share it with your family and friends. These lessons about the return of Christ, the millennium and the tribulation they explain so much to us so that we can live with confidence in a world of confusion. And I trust that you will subscribe to my sermon podcast, follow me on social media and the Mount Perrin Ministry, and get as many people as you know to subscribe and share the Word of God through the media ministry that we provide. So go to the podcast, get your family and friends, hit subscribe and then share with others as well. I wanna thank you for your support of the ministry, for your prayers for the ministry, for your generous support and tithes and offerings. I know that God will bless you richly for your generous giving to support the ministry and our missions work around the world and certainly our missions work here in the city of Atlanta to help communities that are in need. Sunday's the highlight of our week, isn't it? The Lord's Day. We've got a great day planned this Sunday. I'm looking forward to seeing you and your family in church. Invite somebody to go to church with you today. May God bless you richly.